Today's video is sponsored by Brilliant. And in doing so, we're going to get to look at an idea in mathematics, which math students often don't learn, but physics students definitely cover in one of their courses. So there are a couple of topics like this, and I think this one is a nice one. Okay, so what do we need in order to get started here? Well, we're going to need the idea of a functional. And so let's start with the linear algebra idea of a functional, which is simply a linear map or a linear transformation from a vector space down to its base field. So like for examples, you could take the vector space of all two by two matrices and the trace is a linear transformation from this space down to the base field of real numbers. Let's recall that the trace is simply the sum of the diagonal entries. You could also take the linear transformation on R2 defined by left multiplication by this row vector 1, 2, and notice that takes this vector xy and turns it into x plus 2y, which is a number. And both of these are examples of linear transformations. But now what we want to do is look at a different type of vector space, and that's the vector space of smooth functions on the real numbers. Sometimes this is called C infinity R. And we want to look at the functional analysis idea of a functional. And this often doesn't require linearity, so we're going to forget that we have linearity for a second. And so here we'll just need a function from C infinity R to R. So in other words, the inputs are functions and the outputs are numbers. And so let's use this notation, which is maybe not really common right now, but will be useful for as we do our calculation, that X is the function. So in other words, we've got this function X, which takes in numbers and outputs numbers. And we want to somehow assign that function to a number. So there are a couple of maybe standard ways that you might think of to do this really quickly, like you could evaluate this function at a number. So that definitely represents, well, even a linear transformation here. You could integrate that function from A to B, for instance. That would be another idea of a functional. And so here, the function is the variable. So here, your input is the function x, and your output is the integral of that function from a to b. Or you could do something more general, and I'll call this a general family of these so-called functionals. And that is, well, you input a function x, and your output is the integral from a to b of a new function of three variables, that's been evaluated at t, x of t, and x prime of t. And then you integrate that with respect to t. And so that's the type of functional that we want to look at. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this. If you're looking for a free and easy way to learn more about what we're doing in this video, specifically the calculus of variations in Lagrangian mechanics, check out brilliant.org. While watching my videos is a great place to start, you get more out of learning by doing, and that's why I highly recommend you sharpen your skills with Brilliant. From math and data science to data analysis and computer science, Brilliant offers a wide range of topics that'll have you saying, I never knew learning could be this exciting. What really makes Brilliant shine is its problem-solving approach. You won't just passively absorb information, you'll actively learn through hands-on interactive lessons that challenge your thinking and creativity. Brilliant is available on your phone, tablet, or computer, and Brilliant will support you at every step along the way. No matter what skill level you're at, Brilliant can help you improve. Not sure where to start? They have introductory courses in a variety of STEM topics, from calculus, physics, computer science, and more. Keep your love of learning alive with Brilliant's interactive lessons, perfect for those aged 10 to 110. In fact, I use this for my middle school son to help him stay ahead in math. But we're scientists here, so don't take my word for it. You should test it for yourself. Treat yourself to a unique hands-on experience by going to brilliant.org slash MichaelPenn for a 30-day free trial, and the first 200 people will get a 20% off their annual subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video.
Okay, so first we're gonna think about this object right here as a function of x. And so here I've written this g of x just to really show that this is a function of x. And what does it do? Well, it takes x, which is itself a function, here from the closed interval a, b to r, and it wraps it up into this object. So it's the integral from a to b of f of t, x of t, x prime of t, dt. Okay, so how might we minimize such a function? Well, let's think about the extreme value theorem in calculus, which allows us to minimize a function by looking at its critical points, or in other words, the place where the derivative is zero. And that motivates us to get some sort of idea of the derivative of this function g. But in order to do that, let's think about this function f, which is on the inside first. And let's notice that f is really a function of three variables. I'll call those variables uh, t, x, and y. But we could have a functional dependence tree here. So this function f depends on t. It depends on x, but x depends on t because, well, x is a function of t, and it depends on y as well. But y is equal to x prime in that setup over there, which also depends on t. So I want to keep this picture in mind, this tree diagram of variable dependence, because it'll allow us to like apply the chain rule as needed. Okay. So like I said, what we want to do now is to find the idea of the derivative of an object like this. But let's recall, in order to find the derivative, you want to like perturb the input of a function by just a little bit. So in this case, the input is a function itself, so we want to perturb this function x just a tiny bit. So let's maybe think about how we'll do that. And I'm going to draw a picture of what x might look like here. And I can think of it as a curve. So the inputs are t values and the outputs are x values. OK, so let's put our number a here and we'll put our number b here. And let's say over here, this is equal to x of a, and maybe this is equal to x of b. So we just have a feel for what this looks like, and maybe our curve does something like that. So that's our curve x of t in green. Okay, so how could we perturb it? Well, we could perturb it by adding a very, very small curve that pushes us off this green curve, like perhaps we could add a small curve like this. Maybe it would be like this magenta thing would be not the small curve that we're adding, but the addition of the small curve to our original curve. Or perhaps we could do it another way with this purple curve. So there, that would be again an example of perturbing our original green curve by just a little bit. So here's how we want to do this. Let's take what I'll call an arbitrary curve, and I'll call it alpha, and it's going to go from this closed interval a, b, up to the real numbers, and it's going to satisfy a couple of rules. First of all, we should be able to take its derivative, so it should be smooth and stuff like that, and I guess x should also be smooth, but that's in our assumption based off the fact that we're in c infinity, and I guess like this being smooth is also based off of that. Okay. And now notice the endpoints of my perturbed curve were the same as the endpoints of the original curve. That means that the thing that I'm adding on is zero at the endpoints. So in other words, alpha of A is the same thing as alpha of B, which is zero. And then, well, we want to name these perturbed curves something, and let's name them this. Let's name this x epsilon of t. And this is going to be equal to x of t plus epsilon times alpha of t. And now let's notice that x of 0 or x sub 0 of t is simply x of t. So let's keep that in mind as well.
So this is the idea here. Instead of perturbing a point, we're perturbing a whole curve and we'll, we're doing it via this machinery. Okay, so let's see where that takes us. Okay, so here we've got our perturbed curve x sub epsilon. And now here's how we want to think about this. So let's think that we have a function only of epsilon and I'm going to use the notation f of epsilon here. And that's going to be defined well as this functional defined in terms of the integral but where we've plugged in the x epsilons. So in other words it's the integral from a to b of f evaluated at t x epsilon of t and x epsilon prime of t dt. Okay, great. So I know I called this g of x up here. I'm just renaming it to show that the variable here is epsilon or the variable that we want to worry about is epsilon. And then let's maybe notice that we have the following and this is like the really important point of the whole situation. So if our curve x, which let's recall that's a function from a, b to r, minimizes this object right here, which is f epsilon, well, then we know something about the derivative of that. But let's recall that this x is the same thing as x sub zero. Well, so that means that this f epsilon achieves a minimum at epsilon equals zero. And this is our assumption here, that we do have a curve x that makes us achieve this uh, minimum, and we're kind of building the whole thing so that that occurs at this epsilon equals zero. Okay, but now we can use normal calculus to say, okay, well, if we achieve a minimum at epsilon equals zero, that means if we were to take the derivative of this with respect to epsilon, and plug in epsilon equals zero, we should get zero because, well, whenever we have a maximum or a minimum, we have the value of the derivative is zero. Okay, so that means, like I said, df d epsilon evaluated at epsilon equals zero should give us zero. But that doesn't really help us out so much, but it does give us motivation to try and figure out what this object here looks like, this df d epsilon. So let's maybe see if we can do that. Okay, so given that f epsilon is this crazy looking object here, our goal at the moment is to find the derivative of capital F with respect to epsilon. Now let's recall we had this functional dependence tree on the last board and I've amended it a little bit for our current situation. So our function capital F depends on the function little f, which is on the inside of the integral that is, but the function little f depends on t. Notice that capital F does not depend on t though, because this integral with respect to t really integrates the t out of it. So perhaps that branch kind of disappears, but I'll leave it here for now. But then this function f also depends on x epsilon, which depends on epsilon. It also depends on t, but that's been integrated out like we said. And it also depends on x prime epsilon, which depends on epsilon. Again, the t's been integrated out. Okay, so now let's keep that in mind. So in order to find the derivative of f with respect to epsilon, we'll bring that epsilon derivative inside of the integral, which means we're really looking at something like this. We're looking at the derivative with respect to epsilon of f of t x epsilon and x prime epsilon, where I'm leaving off the dependence on t just to make things a little bit shorter. Now, Furthermore, I'd like to recall how this function f is defined just so that we have it on the board. And that is like this, sorry, this function x epsilon. So x epsilon was our original x plus epsilon times our function alpha. And alpha had the property that when evaluated at a and when evaluated at b, we got zero. Okay, so we motivated that before. Okay, so now let's apply the chain rule here, which means we need to take both paths, 
from f down to the epsilon. So notice we've got a path that goes through x epsilon, and we've got a path that goes through x prime epsilon. Okay, so let's see what we get for that. So that's gonna give us, let's see, the partial of f with respect to x times the derivative of x epsilon with respect to epsilon. Okay, so that would be going through this path. You might say, well, notice I don't have an x epsilon here, but that's really because I'm not taking the derivative with respect to x epsilon. This like named part of the variable is x. This named part of the variable is x prime. That's like a little bit of a subtle thing. But now we're gonna do go down this other path to epsilon, which goes through x epsilon prime. So that'll give us the partial of f with respect to x prime, and then the derivative of x epsilon prime with respect to epsilon. Okay, so now that's what we have at the moment. But note that these things are easy to calculate, this x epsilon derivative with respect to epsilon, just by the fact that x epsilon is defined as follows. That simply gives us alpha. And remember, it's a function of t, so for now I'll put alpha of t here. And then similarly, if we just take derivatives of all parts here, since epsilon, well, is a constant with respect to derivatives by t, this will give us alpha prime of t, you know, for essentially the same reason. So let's write that down. We have alpha prime of t here. So since we need this to be equal to zero, we might as well set zero equal to this integral from a to b. So just to be clear, what I'm fitting in here is this df d epsilon evaluated at epsilon equals zero. Okay, and then what goes in here is the following. So we'll have the partial with respect to x of f of, let's see, t, we have x of t and x prime of t. So that would be this bit right here, but then we have to multiply by alpha of t. Okay, good. And you might say, well, why don't I have x epsilons? That's because I've evaluated this at epsilon equals zero. Okay, so this bit right here, let's see if we can be careful. This uh, color coding here is the same thing as this peach over line here. And then we've got that next term as well. So that'll give us plus the partial with respect to x prime of f of t x x prime, and then we've got alpha prime of t dt. And then let's see, this could be pink over line for both of those. And then this dt should really be outside of the whole thing. Okay, so that's what we've got at the moment. But now let's note that this bit right here has an alpha attached, and this bit right here has an alpha prime attached. And in fact, it would be nice if they could both have simply an alpha attached. And we can achieve that by doing integration by parts on this second term. Okay, so let's maybe think about how to do that. So let's just look at the integral from a to b of the partial of f with respect to x prime times alpha prime of t dt. So let's maybe be clear, and that is this pink integral that we're looking at. And I've smushed all the functional dependence of f together just to make it shorter. Okay, so now integrating by parts, Let's take u equal to the partial of f with respect to x prime, and then we'll take dv equal to alpha prime dt. Okay, but notice that that means that du is the derivative with respect to t of the partial of f with respect to x prime. But then v is simply equal to alpha. Okay, again, that's by, you know, the building blocks of the integration by parts formula. Now this should be equal to u times v, so that'll be equal to the alpha of t times the partial of f with respect to x prime. We're evaluating that from t equals a to t equals b. And then from that we subtract the integral from a to b of 
the derivative with respect to t of the partial with respect to x prime of our f of t x prime or x and then x prime. And then we've got alpha of t at the end there, dt. Okay, good. But now let's note that alpha of a and alpha of b are both zero. And so that makes this entire thing right here equal to zero. <clears throat> and then observe that we can just replace this pink overlined integral with this object right here. Okay, so let's start the next board with that. Okay, so we're almost at the end of this first part. And what have we done so far? Well, we've shown that if x, which is a function from a, b to r, minimizes the functional defined by this integral, then, well, this integral is equal to zero. So we've got the integral from a to b, the partial with respect to x of f, and then the total derivative with respect to t of the partial with respect to x prime of that thing. So all of that's equal to zero. But notice that this would be achieved if the integrand itself were equal to zero. So, well, that means that if the integrand is equal to zero, then we have a minimum or we have the possibility of having a minimum. We actually have a critical curve. So that tells us that we have the following setup. So if that's equal to zero, well, we can solve and we'll get the partial with respect to x of f of t x of t x prime of t equals the total with respect to t of the partial with respect to x prime of f of t x of t x prime of t and this is what we've been going for. This is a condition that if satisfied gives the possibility of our function f minimizing our functional up here. And well, there's a special name for this equation. It's called the Euler-Lagrange equation. So now that we've got this, let's maybe look at our main goal. So now back to our original goal, which was to find the curve that minimizes the distance from zero, zero, to a, b. And I've taken those Euler-Lagrange equations on the previous board and I've changed the variable names a little bit just to be more in line with we're looking for a plane curve here, not a curve that's moving with respect to time. So if the curve defined by y, which goes from the interval x0, y0 to r, minimizes our functional, similar to the functional that we saw on the last board, then the Euler-Lagrange equations are satisfied. Okay, so now let's go to this. So let's say we've got here our point zero, zero. So obviously that's equal to the origin. And then let's say here is our point A, B. Okay, good. And now we wanna think about all possible curves from zero, zero to A, B. So of course there are a bunch of different curves that do this. Well, there are in fact infinitely many curves that do this. And we wanna look at all of them and find the one that minimizes the distance. But that means we need to find an integral that uh, tells us the distance. But that's not too hard because there's an arc length formula. So notice the distance will be the integral from zero to a of the square root of one plus y prime squared dx. So I won't go through that. I think this is like well known. So in other words, we have our setup over here where our function f of x, y, y prime is equal to the square root of one plus y prime squared. Where we're thinking about x, y, and y prime all as independent variables. Well, because we're gonna be taking the partials. Okay, so we need the partial with respect to y of the square root of one plus y prime squared to be equal to the derivative with respect to x of the partial with respect to y prime of this square root of one plus y prime squared. But notice there's no y's over here, there's only y primes. And since we're considering those as independent variables, that means that this bit simply goes to zero.
So taking the derivative of this with respect to y prime, we'll have uh, the derivative with respect to x of y prime over the square root of one plus y prime squared must be equal to zero. But anytime you take the derivative with respect to x and you get zero, that means that what is on the inside must be equal to a constant. So maybe I'll call that constant c. But notice that we can rearrange things pretty easily to get to the following equation, and that is y prime squared equals some constant times one plus y prime squared, where I've maybe like renamed the constant as necessary. But I can move some things around even more to give me something like y prime squared times one minus c equals c which tells us that y prime is equal to a constant. Well, we see that because it'll be the constant which is the square root of c over one minus c, but I might as well rename that. And I'm gonna name that constant a. But if y prime is equal to a, that means that y is equal to ax plus b, just by taking the antiderivative of both sides. But now, notice that we have two conditions here. We have the condition that y of zero is equal to zero and y of a is equal to b, just by the fact that we've got a starting point and an ending point here. So pushing that into our equation, we get the following. We'll have y is equal to b over a times x via a fairly simple calculation, but that's exactly what we would expect. That's the equation of a line where the y-intercept is the origin and the slope is b over a. In other words, the curve that minimizes the distance from the origin to the point a, b is a straight line. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.